Can you hear anything? There's one headset. We go up here to speaker. You know, we'll move the screen. Moving the lamp's impossible. Hours. 
So this is extensively used in all our homes today. And of course, by the warmer underwear that the gas in our streets is obviously good for a cold fire. Next slide. Okay, I had I had this chart here to give you an idea of the range of the spin-offs in the aerosol system. Uh, NASA does a lot of satellite imagery, which is directly applicable to farmers in terms of seeing how much oil they use for the disease in the plants itself. Uh, they develop formatting and software that farmers can use. Regenerative farming, uh, what that refers to is optimizing the soil to get the best yield. In other words, the most oxygen, like, like rotating different plants. And things of that nature. So that was transferred to the farmers. And of course, our sense of use of robotics also applies to agriculture as far as picking fruit. Next slide. Okay, NASA was back in you know, March when the virus uh, became a major problem in the United States. The technology people responded very well in terms of trying to help that issue. They developed a small, low-cost ventilator, like 37 days, and then they took this development and turned it into a paper. I can read it. Can you, can you, can you there? No, there are no words online. Uh, My mic is not going to come back. We didn't have enough equipment. You know, masks themselves. Nurses would wear masks for like a week. At a time, they had to rewear it. Well, they came up with a decontamination device where they could actually okay. cleanse the, the mask so the nurses could be using it without a problem. And then the other thing that NASA developed was a low cost oxygen system, which was also very useful. Instead of using very expensive ones, this was a low cost model. Okay, next slide. So what I'd like to discuss now is three technologies from my NASA experience. So I've spent a number of years on each one of these. You're on my wire. So these technologies are being applied today. And the three I'm going to discuss is high speed military aircraft research. Uh, virtual reality is different here. And artificial intelligence. These are three technologies that I had a lot of experience with and had people work in these areas. So I'd like to talk about each one of these. Next slide. In the 1970s, I was transferred to Edwards Air Force Base to manage the supersonic aircraft research program. This was a highly classified program with the Air Force. And the Air Force gave us two SR-71 prototypes. There were three prototypes. One crashed in 1971, but the pilot ejected, so there were two left. And they gave these two prototypes to NASA for the Joint Air Force NASA classified program to look at all aspects of supersonic flight with the interest of designing future military aircraft, which is one of the major military air programs that I was involved in. Uh, because of the classification, I don't talk too much about what we did, but I will tell you this one incident, what we had to do, very high-risk flight testing, we did fight or maneuver. Uh, one, of the, one of the experiments, one of the experiments, what we had to do is shut off the engine where the airplane was going more than 200 meters on. This is the fastest airplane in the world at 2,200 miles per hour, which is like 3.2 times the speed of sound, at an altitude of 85,000 feet. So we did go slow up and go to 3.2 to 85,000 feet, so off the engine to the start below, optimally like 600 miles per hour, and gradually work up. It took us months to slowly increase the speed sure that we were safe to do it. So when the pilot shuts off the engine manually, one of these two engines, they could be able to work there. There, they were just increasing that back on the seat. There were two, you know, pilots in like a, a back seat for the Indian airplane. And then the second airplane was a chase airplane to make sure nothing was happening. So when this 
airplane would shut off the engine, so did the chase airplane, so it could stay in the, 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 the photography. Anyway, that's one of the type of tests that we did. And fortunately, we, everything was safe, and we got very extensive data for like five years. In 1978, there was a secret conference, and Edwards Air Force Base was only the people in the program who could discuss the conference. So the YF-12, which is the prototype, the SR-71 flew from the early 60s until 1998, and then the Air Force retired it. But the next slide shows the follow-on to the SR-71. This is built by Lockheed Martin, the same one that developed the Blackbird, the SR-71. In 2013, the Air Force led a contract to Lockheed Martin and within two years, this airplane should be flying. And the question is whether they're going to tell the public. They will eventually, the public will open the public. And this airplane, when I say hypersonic, hypersonic is more than three and a half times the speed of sound. The expected cruise or maximum speed of this aircraft would probably be six times the speed of sound. That would be my guess. So it has much more capability. Where it could fly from the US to any part of the world, if there's an issue, it's probably one hour. Extreme capability once the US has it. Okay, next slide. Okay, another current uh, ex airplane of NASA, this is NASA, not Air Force or military, is the X 59 supersonic research aircraft. This aircraft is designed specifically for commercial, future commercial transport. One of the major issues with the Concorde that flew through the sonic was the sonic boom over land. In other words, they only wanted to land on airports on a, on a different coast because they should come in the way that airplane was designed had a major sonic boom, which was very noisy. And tomorrow the day we this airplane designed by Lockheed Martin. Yeah. We're going to meet it's after the meeting. Okay. And also to be very fuel efficient. And this airplane will be delivered to NASA and Edwards Air Force Base this year in 2021 and be flying in 2022 over the various communities throughout the United States where they will measure the sign boom and see what the response is of the community. And if they're successful, this will lay the framework for the next generation supersonic transport. Okay, which we could go up to Mach 2. Uh, so, so the whole key in uh, mitigating the uh, sonic boom is what the, uh, uh, the swordfish knows? Yeah, the shape, okay, what determines that? Can you go back? The, the shape of the airplane determines the sonic boom. This is built to reduce that. It's a pressure wave that comes off the airplane as you go from supersonic to subsonic. Okay, the shape of the airplane, they think from the aerodynamics and the testing they've done on this, that this should reduce it significantly where it's almost, you know, not noticeable, very noticeable. Okay, is that, isn't that fine? So anyway, the next technology I'm gonna talk about is virtual reality. In the 1980s, our human factors people, which I have responsibility for, were one of the early national labs developing virtual reality. And this is the actual workstation where in about 1986-87, they put me into that workstation. And this has a tactile device where I was in the vortex of a tornado and I could move around that three-dimensional field. But in, that, in those days, computer technology was pretty not near as sophisticated as it was today, but it was amazing. Okay, uh, go back. The current workstation over there on the right hand side is at Johnson Space Center, where you see two astronauts training for, before they do spacewalk to the International Space Station. If someone has never done a spacewalk before, what they do, they actually visualize being outside. International Space Station and doing the actual manipulation of whatever they're going to fix. So they have a real good feel for what.
what they're going to experience when they get out of the space. Okay, and that's currently being used at Johnson Space Center. Can you see this, Roger? Did you, you want to move over so you can see this slide? Okay, next slide. Okay, so the virtual reality applications used today, it's come a long way in the last 35 years from the 1980s, is designing cars on the upper left. On the upper right, uh, virtual reality is used for training uh, medical students. Lower left, uh, in terms of entertainment, where the students you know, actually jump out at you, 3D, and of course they have 3D movies now in terms of use of virtual reality. And on the lower right, in the real estate industry, maybe some of you have taken virtual 3D tours of, of homes. So virtual reality is used extensively across the United States and uh, in many different areas. Okay, the third area I want to talk about and have an experience with. Again, in 1980, I had a group of information systems division where about 25% of them worked on the early development of AI research. Okay. In those days, AI was very crude and we didn't expect it was able to do too much. The first thing that they were able to do in the late 80s, we were able to schedule shuttle operations where there were like you know, a thousand people working on the shuttle and maybe 20 contractors. Well, if there was a problem in one area, what was the implication of the rest of the schedule? So we were able to use AI for that, but that's, that's a fairly simple application of AI. Now I'm going to jump 25 years later, or 35 years later, to how AI is used in, in the space program. Next slide. So the current AI space application is up here to study the atmosphere and chemistry of exo exoplanets or planets outside our solar system, where we're trying to determine the habitability of the planets. You know what I'm saying? Is there, are there conditions there that could sustain life? And we can do this with AI, you know, the combination of input from both probes and the whole telescope. We take that information and send it to the AI, AI algorithms and determine that. The second application is to provide autonomy for like rovers like on Mars. Right now it can take anywhere from five to 20 minutes for a signal to go from Earth to Mars. Well, that's a lot of time. If we could have an AI system on the rover, the current rover Perseverance, that's on Mars today, it can make its own decisions in terms of the environment and the react to that environment. So these are two applications of AI that be very sophisticated because the system actually learns the more data and information the artificial intelligence system has, the better it improves in terms of making a decision. Okay, next. Okay, AI application is used extensively in all aspects of business and medicine. I can show two of them here. In finance, in marketing, on the right, it shows where AI can actually change and, and have people decide what you know type of shoes they want to, to, to buy. In terms of our, uh, for example, you know many of the companies uh, that you buy online know exactly what your preferences are. You know, Amazon, for instance, uses AI in their software extensively. Right. Uh, it's used in healthcare in terms of diagnostics for the doctors. Right now, there's so much information in terms of research, medical research, the doctors have difficulty keeping up with. Through AI software and diagnostic software, it can serve as an aid to medical doctors. And then another application, obviously, is driverless vehicles. The first, I think, will be large trucks. In the southwest, they're actually driving them now on test cases. Real quick, go ahead. And they have been used today by the Russians for presidential elections. Yes. Yeah. 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 I would say if anybody is Chinese, because 
And this is, you know, a major investment as far as capability. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to now a trans, uh, look at the International Space Station characteristics. Uh, the length is like the length of a football field, 400 feet, weighs 295 pounds, and that's a lot of weight. That's why it took 42 flights to get all the pieces up there, right? Because you had to do it piece by piece with rockets. The capability in terms of characteristics, it sleeps six astronauts at a time, has two bathrooms, a gym where the astronauts work out every day. 360-degree bay window where they have fantastic views of Earth and Cape Connect up to six bases. Okay, uh, before I go to the next slide, up until a week ago, the International Space Station was the only space station flying around in orbit around the Earth until a week ago. And I'll tell you what happened yet. So I'm going to look at other countries. Space stations now on the next slide. Okay, Russia had put up the Russia MERS space station was up for 50 years from 1986 to 2001, shown on the left. The Chinese put a couple of small space stations up to one in 2011. It's called Kagan 1. It was up for seven years. It actually just came down to Earth uh, because of some problem. And then the Chinese put up Pagan 2, which lasted from 2016 to 2019. But in the last several years, the Chinese have been developing a new space station. And just last week, they put a module, their first module of their new space station. Modular what? Right, so on the upper left, Roger, I think the block you view here, the first module was put up, I think it was May 15th. The rocket that put this module on, but I think you might have heard on the news, came down in That's for sure. It's supposed to, the guy to make sure it goes to the ocean, but fortunately it did. But so this is their first module, and on the lower picture is the artist concept of when they complete the station, they hope to complete it in 2022. And this is going to be about one-fourth the size of the international so that, that could be a concern for the U.S. in terms of how they actually use this station. So next slide, I'm going to talk about accomplishments of the station. It's obviously been occupied continuously for the last 21 years, which is amazing, right? Uh, considered by more than 242 individuals from 19 countries. Conducted probably a lot more than, say, 232 space walks. But the primary purpose of the space station is to do experiments. And I'm going to talk about you know, over 3,000 experiments for the benefit of the U.S. and mankind. And I'm going to talk about some of those experiments. Next slide. So we have like four areas. One, many experiments in biology, such as stem cell growth, to do things in general, these that you can do in one piece. Uh, a tremendous amount of human research, which I'm going to discuss some specifics. Uh, student experiments. Over 26,000 students from around the world, because this is a joint international program, and 800 experiments are actually flown on the shuttle. So that's certain stimulated student interest. And of course, another use for the space station is monitoring natural disasters, such as, you know, the the uh, fires on the west coast and the floods and hurricanes on the east coast. Okay, that slide shows some human uh, health experiments on osteoporosis, which is a major concern. You know, zero G in fact in, uh, affects the bones of, of astronauts and that's just related to osteoporosis. So what they learned there can also be applied here on Earth. <coughs> NASA developed advanced ultrasound on the upper right there. And the reason for that, they wanted to use ultrasound that you didn't need a medical person to be able to use it. Something that was simple and low cost, they could actually use on the International Space Station, uh, which again could be applied here on Earth in rural areas where they want real expensive ultrasound and they could uh, use this type of equipment. Uh, detection of immune changes is very important because you don't have doctors on the space station or in space that if they can check the blood and look at the immune system, 
to see whether there's a possibility of some kind of a health problem they can detect it early. Okay, so that's another area of research. And in the area of vaccine development, what NASA did, what they were looking at is food poisoning, which is something you don't want to get if you're on the International Space Station, right? So they want to avoid that. So I think all astronauts, once they develop this vaccine, I think they could develop the astronauts to make sure they don't have food poisoning. Okay, next slide. Some of the other experiments have been in the belt, understanding Alzheimer's. Why this is why they got involved in this it is the purity effect the mind relative to Alzheimer's. Because you know, a couple of my astronauts have already been more than a year in space. How does that affect the brain, you know, in terms of memory loss? So that that is very useful to get us on our growing protein crystals in space mm -hmm. because of zero gravity, they can do that much better than they can on Earth. And these protein crystals can be used for future drugs. Okay, another area of research on the space station is fabricating new tissue. They can fabricate uh, a bone, uh, what is that called? A liver, and cartilages. There's three examples that I remember. And then, of course, water purification techniques that's used on the space station, they actually recycle the dirt, believe it or not. And those te simplified techniques can be in rural areas, you know, in the poorer countries of the world. So next slide. So I'm going to now go back into 2011 when we canceled the space shuttle. At that time, the U.S. had no rockets to either resupply the station. The station's been up there since 1990, right? And no way to supply get supplies or get astronauts, we were totally dependent on the Russians. Okay, and initially they gave us a good price, less than what we paid for the shuttle, but they kept increasing the price. So the answer is that we can't depend on the Russians totally, right? We have to build that capability in the U.S. So what they did is actually set out and let two contracts, one in terms of, of, of space station resupply, and the second contract to get commercial crew program to get astronauts to the station. So examples of that in the next slide are the two companies. Next slide. Uh, they let contracts with Northrop Grumman and SpaceX to resupply the station. It took several years before they were actually had that capability. So like in 2013 or so, we were able to actually supply the station. We continued to use the Russians in some manner, but then we implemented added our US capability to be able to do that. The next slide shows our focus of the US commercial crew program. It's just the astronauts, so the, the module has to be safe enough to be able to send astronauts. So we let two contracts, one with Boeing and also SpaceX. The Boeing Starliner has not flown with astronauts yet. We have one more flight this year to ensure it's safe. And then hopefully by early next year, the Boeing Starliner capsule, the atmosphere is a proven rocket, but the Starliner still needs to be verified. At least one more flight before they put astronauts on. The SpaceX Dragon has had three flights, and I'm going to show you what those are. The first flight was May 30th, 2020, which is a major milestone, so it took us nine years so when the shuttle was canceled in 2011 to May 30th, for us to be getting astronauts to the station. And then the second flight was on November 15, 2020, where we sent four astronauts to the station. And then the next slide shows on April 23rd, we sent four astronauts to the station. And why does this picture show 11? This is a picture on the station on April 24th. The four people in the middle in the black shirts are the four people that went out on April 23rd. The seven people on the blue shirts are the seven astronauts were on the existing shuttle. So for about a week and a half, we had 11 astronauts on the International Space Station. And then after a couple of weeks, so the weather was good enough for the capsule to come back, four of these people in the blue shirts came back to the U.S. And so now we have seven astronauts. On the space station. So 
we had three successful flights there of the U.S. and the astronauts. So, so, so some of the other space rockets, uh, the Falcon 9 level heavy, we use the Falcon 9 to get the supplies to the station. SpaceX has actually combined these three together, and this has been a very successful rocket. It's flown uh, two, uh, at least three times, I know of. And NASA plans to use this particular rocket in 2022 to set up some, to put some satellites up and also to go to an asteroid called Psyche. Okay? And then on the right is a super heavy starship. You probably heard about this in the news. This is uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk, baby, where he could, uh, this will have the capability to take 100 people to either Mars or the moon eventually. But he's had a number of mishaps at four mishaps when he tried to land the active booster. It you know, blew up several times. But he had a very successful flight. I think it was like May 10th, the last one was successful. And it's his money that's developing this capability, and he hoped to be able to go to the moon. He's got a contract, SpaceX, uh, with a billionaire from Japan to take, to take six people around the moon in 2023. Whether he beats that bill, we don't know. But the, the, the fact that SpaceX is building this capability, NASA can certainly use it eventually, right? Uh, so I think it's a very beneficial to the U.S. to do this, uh, mostly with his own money. Okay. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to now turn my attention to the U.S. robotic accomplishment, uh, a large Perseverance rover that uh, left the U.S. in July, landed on Mars, or got to Mars in February, and they landed this rover. This rover is the most sophisticated rover the U.S. has ever had in terms of instruments and capability. And the next slide shows the Mars helicopter has been in the news. It's flown five times. This is the first vehicle uh, that actually flew on another planet. You know, the atmosphere is very thin, so this has to be very light. But it can do, do surveillance of Mars much quicker than the rover and move very small, right? And so we've had five successful flights up and out. The next slide shows a couple of instruments. And on the left here is one that's very important. This instrument on the Perseverance rover converts oxygen for the Mars atmosphere. The Mars at atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide. Okay, but there's enough oxygen there that they can convert. If we want to go to Mars, it would be very beneficial if we could make enough oxygen for the astronauts and not take it with them, right? So this is a very important instrument to make sure that's successful. Another thing I wanted to show on the other side of the slide is a sample return instrument. One of the things that the Perseverance rover is going to do is take samples of the Mars soil, and then later, several years later, we're going to bring that sample back. And on the end there is the actual instrument itself, where they can get a dozen or more you know, samples. We'll bring those back to the U.S. eventually. Next slide. Okay, China also has some robotic accomplishments. They left last July again because that was a window at the same time the U.S. did it. And they, they got to Mars in February, just like the first American rover, but they kept orbiting because they wasn't ready to bring the lander and the rover down yet. They circled quite a few months, and then just May 15th, I believe, they, they landed both the rover and the lander on Mars. And the picture on the right, we just taken a day or so ago, is the actual picture from the Chinese rover on Mars. Okay, this is two days ago. That's a different picture. So the Chinese are really building their capability. So the next slide shows China's moon sample return mission was, was last November, and then they asked, that's the rocket, and on the right is the actual spaceship, and they brought the uh, samples back to Earth uh, last December. So China's building their robotic capability. Next slide. 
Okay, now I'm going to talk about future plans uh, for space flight. In 2017, the uh, Space Advisory Committee for the United States made these recommendations to return humans to the moon for long-term exploration, followed by human mission to Mars and other destinations. And so that was the recommendation. As a result of this recommendation, the next slide shows what NASA came up with, which is called the Artemis Program. The name Artemis comes from Greek mythology. Uh, in Greek mythology, Artemis is a trans twin sister of Apollo, and Apollo is the goddess of the moon. That's how they came up with the name. Okay, so our role here, you want to keep going? Okay, hopefully, I mean, this program in terms of building the capability the last several years, to me, from my standpoint, is re establishing American leadership in space. We need to demonstrate new technologies to go to the moon and Mars. And of course, we need to broaden our partnerships, both, both with the U.S. industry and international partnerships to be able to do this program. We should call sharing, which is very important. Okay, looking at the Artemis program, here's some of the international partners. In fact, just two days ago, we added South Korea. Even President Biden had a meeting with uh, South Korea, the President, Prime Minister. They agreed that they would be added as an international to the Artemis program. And we expect more other countries to be in this list. As you can see, Russia is not in the list yet. Uh, China most likely won't be in the list, and I'll come back to that maybe after my briefing and find out. So, next slide. Okay, a space policy director back in December that directly support this Artemis program was to increase our emphasis on space nuclear power systems for the moon and Mars. What, why do we need this is, let's say if you land on the far side of the moon, there's no sun, you can't use solar power. The most likely other option would be nuclear power, but these systems that they're developing could actually supply like 10,000 watts of power to each system with a nuclear reactor. Okay, so the U.S. is now increasing that development of these systems. In addition, we're putting a major emphasis on advanced nuclear propulsion systems for human exploration beyond the moon. In fact, the U.S. government, DARPA, the Venus Advanced Development Project Agency, had actually left three contracts to develop nuclear propulsion systems, one for the nuclear reactor and two others for the total system. So it has both military and civil applications. Of system. Next slide. Okay, these are some of the major elements of the new Artemis program. The space launch system, Boeing is a contractor. You can see it is uh, very large, 322 feet tall, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. That's 15% more thrust than we had under Sandra 5 when we had the moon in the 60s. I mean, they're making progress. You know, they have ups and downs, but I think we're moving forward. And it is development, hopefully within a year or so, the first flight with all astronauts to the moon would take place. That's the Artemis one flight. Next slide. The Oregon crew capsule is being built by Lockheed Martin. The uniqueness of this capsule, it has the capability uh, with an abort system in case there's a major problem in launch or descent. When the shuttle flyer happened or during launch, Previously, if you had an abort system like this where the capsule could escape, it would be safe. So that they've added this safety feature in the Artemis program. Next slide. Uh, this is the Lunar Orbital Gateway. The purpose of this is like a mini space station which would orbit the moon. Okay, where the astronauts would get supplies or, you know, fuel or whatever they need to go for rest. It's a temporary. Quarters instead of going back to Earth, they could go to this uh, space station, get what they wanted, and go back to the moon and continue their activities. Next slide. Another uh, part of the Artemis hardware is the solar electric propulsion spacecraft. The purpose of this is to change the orbit of the gateway, the one that orbits the, with the 
orbiting the moon, you could change the orbit by using this propulsion system. Okay, that's another piece of hardware is a lunar lander. They actually had three companies of Blue Origin with one of them. This is their example of their lunar lander called the Blue Moon. Next slide. Okay, the Artemis timeline to the moon and Mars. The robotic mission to the moon, shown on the upper part of the slide, is to look for where the water might be or where we might land. In other words, to kind of compare with the astronaut where we might land to use this robotic mission. Hopefully, the plans and this plans is to go to the moon in 2024. That's dependent on the NASA budget and the support by Congress, right? Mars sample return, I showed you the sample return uh, capability by the Perseverance rover. Every two years, we have an option to go through back to Mars to pick up those samples. My guess it won't happen, it won't get in the budget, but maybe uh, my guess would be maybe 2026. You know what I'm saying? Because of other areas of emphasis. The possibility of a moon base by 2030, and then astronauts to Mars in the mid 2030. These are realistic if we have continued support to the overall Artemis program. Next slide. Okay, I've added this slide here to give you an idea of NASA approach to search that, that should be the one. to know is there life beyond Earth, right? So our first approach is we need to understand the history of the universe and how it has evolved. And Hubble has gave us tremendous insight into this particular issue. We want to identify environments that may support life and these might exist. In other words, we're using AI now to look at the atmosphere and chemistry of these planets. And I would say today there are definitely planets outside our solar system that could have life, either had life or could have life. On the basis of what NASA has discovered today. Okay. And the other thing is we, we want to know how life we, we detect communication from whoever's out there to get your radio radio optical signatures. Uh, my son, who works for Lockheed Martin, has instrumentation on his roof in Sunnydale, California, to look at signals from outer space. And he's a volunteer to do their data analysis for the study that you search for dust resistant life in the universe. Okay. Uh, that's my question. And you, know, you can't talk about some of that. Anyway, I thought I'd really have to use the next slide. So I'm going to talk about future space opportunities. Tourism is going to be a major factor in near stream. The new rocket, new Shepard rocket of Blue Origin, they're now auctioning off it's the last seat. It's going to be in July. They're going to take six people in suborbital flight like for 20 minutes. It's up to $2.8 million now in the auction. Can you believe that for one seat? To go 20 minutes on some of our uh, So, and they've already checked out their system and it's good to go as far as taking, you know, not astronaut people there. This is just sub orbital flight. Virgin Galactic is another company doing space tourism. They just had a very uh, good flight a couple of days ago in terms of checking out whether they're ready to send visitors. I would expect next year there'll be, well, in fact, in the fall, they have a contract with the Italian Air Force to take four of their people up, you know, for like 20 minutes or so in their space plane that's launched from the EVE aircraft. And they're going to pay $500,000 a piece for those, that's $2 million for that flight. So it's very lucrative for, for this capability if they do it often enough, right? Okay, the other thing I would just mention briefly is that NASA now is accepting none. As an astronauts from the space station, either to the Russian uh, office or the US SpaceX, at least once a year, but they pay extensive a lot of money in terms of using the station. You know, with two or three people who have millions of dollars and go up and stay on the station and they work with the astronauts and what they have to play for that service. And, and it's very expensive. Okay. So the, the tourism would be. It, as far as U.S. capability, is going to be expanding over the next several years. Next slide. Right. Another space opportunity is mining. On the moon, obviously, we're interested in water. Another thing is helium-3 
It's a fuel that we could use, and then other materials for maybe a moon base. Okay, asteroids are small planets or small objects that rotate along the sun, rotate around the sun, and they have very precious metals. And so we're, we've gone to one asteroid already, and we're bringing back samples to you this but it's on, re, on the return to an astronaut. But we have another flight, the next slide shows another flight to an asteroid, a NASA probe to study an asteroid near Jupiter. So it's going to take several years to get there, and several years back, and that's going to be launched just in October 2021. So we're doing research on those particular objects. Next slide. Another space opportunity is manufacturing, most likely. Our 3D printing capability could be used to build certain elements on a boat or other places. Uh, NASA has run up several contracts to look at the feasibility of space solar power. So there are locations either on the moon or in space or the satellite where the sun shines seven days a week, 24 hours a day. If we could take that energy and beam it back to Earth, which they said we can do microwave. We need to continue to source of energy. Because let's say we had a problem with energy supply in the US, we could use space power, space solar power to be the back of Earth. Next opportunity. Next slide. Okay, uh, future space opportunity include research outposts on a moon or Mars, or space settlement. On this picture of the settlement, I saw uh, the, the people would live in a lava tube because that would protect. Radiation is a major concern, obviously, if you get out in space, right? And if they could protect themselves underground, that would be a logical way to have a space settlement when you're out in space. Next slide. Okay, this is my second last slide here. I'm going to compare U.S. and Russian China strengths. From my perspective, the U.S. excels more than any other country in two areas understanding the universe. With, with what we've learned from, shop, from the Hubble telescope the last three years and our robotic mission. We've been to Mars, for instance, a dozen times. China's only been there once, and that's the most difficult robotic mission. Okay. Uh, so I think in those here, and in the last, say, five years, the U.S. is really building up their capability in rockets. You know, after the show, we were all, but now we're increasing that capability to space that capability. As far as rockets, Russia' major strength has been and continues to be their rocket capability. We were highly dependent on them, that, you know, in terms of the, the space station, and they continue to have that capability. <laughs> China, however, in the last two or three years, has significantly improved both their rocket capability and their robotic mission. With the one mission to Mars and their one mission to the Moon, where they had. Sample. So they're really building their capability. That's, I just want to kind of give you an overview and we can go in more detail if we have further questions. Last slide. I wanted to come up if somebody came up to me and said, could you in three words uh, describe NASA benefits? And the three words I would use is innovation, inspiration, and partnership. I gave you many examples of some of the spinoffs in terms of NASA research and how it benefited the U.S. In 2019, there was an economic study in terms of what's the impact of NASA programs. And it, the impact was, in 2019, $64 billion to the U.S. economy and 312,000 jobs. So obviously, the innovation at NASA and then a big part of that is through the innovation and the implementation of, of how the industry implemented NASA research. The second one, in terms of inspiration, there's no better inspiration than have students around the world be able to put their excursions on the shelf on the International Space Station. So it has obviously encouraged careers in science, technology, and engineering management, which is very important for the U.S. because right now we have a shortage in this capability. And then the third is partnerships. NASA has always been very good in terms of partnerships, not only with the industry and the Department of Defense, but the international partnerships relative to the space station. It's 
2000 has been in such a with the Russians. We had very good, we continue to have very good relationship with the Russians as far as supporting the space station. So this gives us an opportunity to address global challenges. And I'm going to, in my closing remarks, see global challenges. That's our major issue to the world. One is space debris, which I haven't mentioned. There's so many, there's 24,000 satellites out there and a lot of rough, you know, other pieces of hardware floating around in space becomes a major problem. And that's a global challenge. The second one is climate, right? The climate issue is a global problem. And the third, I would say, is pandemics. It just makes it three that we need to get a handle on over our global point of view. Okay, with that, I'm going to close and open it up to any kind of questions you may have on any topic. Go ahead. I'm pretty proud to be here and work there. Go ahead. You want to go first? Um, how much longer do you expect the uh, National Space Station to serve? What was that now? How much longer? What's the life? Oh, okay. That's a good question. Do you want?
So if we find life on other planets, um, what will our society's reaction likely be to that? Well, that's a good question. If, if, let's say if we found life, that life exists in some form of life, that would be, uh, you know, amazing, right? And people all over the world would think, would, I, my personal view is there's got to be life out there someplace. Earth may not be, I don't want to get into the UFO framework, but they, they do things that none of our wisdom technology can even imagine is classified. So all I'm saying is, there, there must be life out there, my guess is someplace, and that's a major discovery, and you know, we may be in it someday, that maybe not in your or my lifetime, or a grandkids' lifetime, where we actually communicate with people from other worlds. We don't know, right? that's, a, that's a guess. It all comes down to curiosity. Yeah, the curiosity is always there, and the only way we're going to do it is to continue exploring, right? And instead of trusting on with uh, new adventures, in terms of outer space. And you know, a lot of the knowledge that we gain significantly, like even as space agents, it's a 250 miles away over the Earth, we learn tremendously in terms of research that benefited the on Earth. I gave you many examples. In the same way with some of the stuff that we're going to do, you know, moon base or even a Mars base, that capability, we're going to learn a lot in terms of what may be applicable to here on Earth that would be beneficial. That's my perspective. Okay, go ahead. How much just... time does it take for astronauts to reach Mars? Can you repeat that? Uh, how much time to reach Mars? Oh, how much time to go to Mars is like seven months. We, we left, Perseverance rover left in July and October, it's about seven months. And yet, it is only a two year window because the two orbits of Earth and Mars are closer together every two years. So we have to go a year from July would be the next time it's the closest, but it would take seven months. Now, if we went a time where it wouldn't be closest, it may take nine months or ten months or a year. You know what I'm saying? So you want to have the two orbits lined up. So it takes. So my my guess is that we're going to send astronauts to Mars. The, the trip back and forth is 14 months, and you're not just going to have them go and come back. They're going to be there three, probably six months would be the two year window. So my guess is astronauts would be gone two years if we go to Mars. And so that's why I think it's very important to check out all the technology when it only takes three days to get to the moon. Get all that stuff, all the wrinkles of the technology developed and secure. And you don't want to practice that going to Mars because you can't make a mistake. You've got to make sure you can get there. They can sustain life. The astronauts have enough oxygen. Fuel be protected from radiation for two years. And, and the minimal effect of zero gravity in their bodies and then bring them back. So that's why it, it, you have to do it in a stepwise approach. Okay? Uh, well, I appreciate your good questions. They're all thought for both of you. Thank you.